Yeah. Hello, all. Thank you so much for attending um, this edition of the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collection and University Archives 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. Today, I am very honored to introduce Dr. Jill Bender, um, who we work with quite a bit on a variety of fascinating classes. Uh, Dr. Bender is the Associate Professor of History at UNC Greensboro. She is the author of the book, The 1857 Indian Uprising in the British Empire. And she has also published several book chapters and journal articles, including Empire and Ireland in the Princeton History of Modern Ireland and the British German Legion and the Irish Marriage Force, Assisted Immigration Schemes and the Mid-Victorian British Empire in the Journal of British Studies. Her research has received support from several funding bodies, including the Fulbright New Zealand, the National Humanities Center, and the National Endowment for Humanities. Dr. Bender is currently working on a second book project, Assisted Immigrants, Irish Female Migration Projects and the British Empire, in which she examines the famine era migration of women from Ireland's workhouses to colonies in Australia, Canada, and South Africa. So now, please help me welcome Dr. Bender to speak on locating Jack the Ripper in the archives. Thank you, Jill. Well, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, hopefully, y'all can see that. Uh, if not, please let me know. Uh, well, thank you again for having me here today and for inviting me to be involved in this. Uh, I absolutely love collaborating with those at SUA, and so I was very honored to be asked to participate in the speaker series, uh, you know, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the archives. So as far as Jack the Ripper, let me start by giving you just a, a brief overview of the case itself. Um, over the course of about 10 weeks in the fall of 1888, London was terrorized by a string of murders, and all five victims were women. All five murders were absolutely brutal. The women were strangled and their throats were cut. The crimes also involved acts of sexual and anatomical mutilation. And a detail that I've always found particularly chilling is that in many of these cases, the perpetrator would stack the victim's belongings and leave them in a neat pile at the women's feet. So these were cold-blooded crimes and they were likely the work of one individual, a serial killer, although that term was not in wide use really until the 1970s. The murders were performed at night or in the, the very early hours of the morning, but they occurred in well-populated areas. Even still, there were no witnesses no clues, no perceivable motives. And so the police were at a loss and the murderer was never caught. Instead, with time, the crimes have been attributed to an individual known as Jack the Ripper. Now, right in the midst of these murders, on October 1st, 1888, W.T. Steed, the editor of the Pall Mall Gazette wrote, there is only one topic throughout all England. And I think that's probably true. The crimes of Jack the Ripper became an absolute public sensation. People were fascinated by these crimes and this fascination was encouraged and I think shaped by the press. These crimes continue to fascinate today. Now, as Kathleen mentioned in, in her introduction, I am a historian of Britain and more specifically the British Empire. And to be honest, Jack the Ripper is, is not actually a topic of my own scholarship. Um, and not one that I've researched in the archives myself, not one that I've published on. And so in preparing for this talk, I relied very heavily on, on the work of other historians, especially um, Judith Wachowitz and also Perry Curtis. And what I'm doing right now is verbally footnoting my comments. Now, even though I've not published on these crimes, the mystery of Jack the Ripper has provided a really important and key case study in many of my classes, especially my survey class on the history of Britain from 1688 to the present. And anytime we cover this case study in my classes, as much respect as I have for UNCG students, which I have a tremendous amount of respect for UNCG students, I tell them we're not going to solve this mystery in the course of a semester. But the crimes, the way the, way, the, way the crimes were investigated, the ways in which they were reported, can tell us a lot about late Victorian society. 
And so I'm going to offer a, a similar caveat today. We were not going to solve the case of Jack the Ripper over the next 30, 35 minutes. But I will try to dive a little deeper into different components of this case, um, looking in particular at the crimes of Jack the Ripper. I'm trying to contextualize those historically at the location in which these crimes occurred. Um, and then finally, also at the suspects, the list of suspects that was generated at the time. And look into these different components of the Jack the Ripper case for insight into late Victorian notions of gender, of class, and also of social reform. Now, I gave you a bit of background on, on the crimes themselves, but I want to talk about the actual victims for a moment. Jack the Ripper has been suspected of a number of crimes. He's been accused of a number of crimes really across the world, across the decades, across the centuries. But experts have settled on five particular uh, killings that are deemed official killings that were likely the work of one individual. And the first of those victims was a woman named Mary Ann or Polly Nichols. Uh, her body was discovered on August 31st, 1888. She was 42 years old. She was married, but had been separated from her husband. And she was the mother of five children. Now she reportedly lived off uh, rather meager earnings from prostitution and she struggled to make ends meet. She was reportedly a heavy drinker. She moved from one lodging house to another uh, or slept outside when necessary. And apparently just before her death, she was reported to have been spotted drunk and soliciting a man. The second victim was Annie Chapman, born Eliza Ann Smith. Her body was found a little over a week later on September 8, 1888. Chapman at the time of her death was 47. She was the wife of a Windsor coachman, a man named John Chapman, uh, but he had left her several years earlier. And so at the time of her death, she was living with another man. Um, she was also the mother of two children. Her friends referred to her as Dark Annie. She too was reported to be a heavy drinker. And uh, she reportedly tried to earn an honest living at times, but frequently found herself driven back to prostitution in order to pay for food, clothing, and drink. The third victim was Elizabeth Stride. Uh, her body was found about three weeks later on September 30th, 1888. Stride was known as Long Liz. She was 45 when she died. Stride was born in Sweden and had actually identified as a sex worker and got as young as the age 17. She came to London in 1866, where she married John Stride, with whom she had nine children. Apparently, she later falsely um, claimed that her husband had died in a shipwreck, and after which she began a rather transient life uh, in, East End, in the East End of London. She worked as a prostitute, a seamstress, and a domestic servant. And like others, she was reported to be a heavy drinker, and actually, she she did have a record of arrest for drunken disorderly behavior. The next victim was Catherine Eddowes, who also went by Kate Kelly or Kate Conway. She actually, Eddowes actually died about an hour or less than an hour after Stride. And so these two, the third and fourth victims or murders were um, considered to be you know, the, a double murder. Eddowes at the time of her death was in her mid forties. She was also an alcoholic. In her 20s, she had lived with an Irish soldier with whom she had three children. She later left this soldier for another man, a man named John Kelly, around 1880. Eddowes earned money by selling goods, working as a cleaning woman. It's also possible, maybe likely, that she did occasionally solicit, but her partner, Kelly, swore that she was not a prostitute. And the final victim that I'd like to mention is, is Mary Ann or Mary uh, sorry, Mary Jane or Mary Ann Kelly. Her body was found uh, more than a month later on November 9th, 1888. Kelly was Irish. Unlike the others, she was much younger. Uh, she was only 24 at the time of her death. She came to London in 1884 and followed, she came following the, the death of her first husband in a mine explosion. When she arrived to London, she began work as an upmarket prostitute or sex worker in Knightsbridge before drifting toward 
the rougher clientele of the East End. She too was reported to be a heavy drinker. Now, as I said, this fifth murder um, deviates a little bit from the first four uh, in part because she was much younger and also because Kel uh, Kelly's murder occurred inside rather than outdoors. Now, I certainly don't want to blame the victims, but I do want to point to some of the similarities that I think can be drawn across all five of these murders. Um, starting with the victims themselves, the women, uh, with the exception of Kelly, as I mentioned, were all in their 40s. That meant that they were considered to be past their prime. Someone who's 45, take a, take, I'll take a deep breath with that. They were considered to be past their prime. All of these women were impoverished. All were reported to practice prostitution. Those who lived with men did so outside of wedlock and all five were considered to be heavy drinkers. There are also similarities I think that we can draw across the crimes themselves. All of these crimes occurred on weekends toward the end or the beginning of the month. Uh, they all occurred uh, very, very late at night or even in the early hours of the morning. All of the attacks were brutal. The women's bodies were subject to significant mutilation. Uh, the perpetrator's modus operandi included or involved deep cuts across the throat from left to right. Pelvic mutilations, um, four of the five were disemboweled and two, possibly uh, three also had their uterus removed. No weapon was ever found, but due to the nature of the wounds, the police and medical examiners assumed that a long, sharp dissecting knife was used in these crimes. Now, the next area of similarity that I want to focus on is the location. Now, four of the five murders were actually committed within a quarter of a quarter mile of each other, so they, they occurred quite close. All five of them were committed in Whitechapel, which is kind of the, was kind of the hub of London's East End. Um, I'm going to click on this link here, which hopefully you all can see that. This is a digitized version of a, a map from by Charles Booth. Uh, Charles Booth had created these maps as a product of a social inquiry or survey, um, which he launched in the late 1880s to study poverty, living conditions, uh, population movements, education, and more. And this particular map, as you can hopefully see, um, looking at the legend, really indicates the level, those levels of poverty or wealth across London. And so the dark, the blackest is, is kind of the lowest class of the poorest. The gold represents the upper middle and upper classes. And you can see, again, looking at this map, that the West End of London is largely gold. It was much more prosperous. Um, Middle class, upper class region, whereas the east end is darker, more impoverished, and that's the area where Whitechapel is located. The east end did become home or was home to a number of slums, and these slums were overcrowded. They were notorious for their squalid living conditions. Most families were crammed into single room accommodations without proper sanitation or ventilation. Whitechapel specifically within the East End was overcrowded. It was polluted. It was crime ridden. Furthermore, it was home to over 200 common, common lodging houses, which provided shelter for nearly 8,000 homeless and destitute people every night. Now in the late Victorian period, uh, there was a, a really growing fascination with the East End and with Whitechapel more specifically Middle-class Victorians were both, were, were really actually obsessed with class conflict and with ideas of social denigration, both of which they thought were exemplified by the region of Whitechapel. Some individuals believed that the slums in Whitechapel were the result of or evidence of the laziness, the sin, the perceived vice of the lower classes. So there were many individuals who blamed uh, the lower classes for the situation. Others, however, began to argue that the slums were caused by poverty, unemployment, social exclusion, and homelessness, and they hoped to reform the area. So you kind of have this division of people uh, blaming the impoverished for their poverty and also blaming the social ills. 
And we see these con competing interpretations play out over the case of Jack the Ripper, and especially in the, the potential suspects who were identified. Now, many Victorians believed in the existence of a hardened criminal class composed of hereditary offenders who preyed on honest civilians. So criminal tendencies could be, or were thought that they, it was thought that criminal tendencies could be um, or were inherited. And if this was a the case, there was a really significant interest in determining how the criminal class could be identified. So what kinds of physical traits might reveal the deviant behavior of individuals? Could criminals be spotted by the hairs on their head, by facial features, by something like a large forehead? And you can see in this image that I have um, up on the PowerPoint right now, these are illustrations of, of individuals who've been convicted of murder and kind of trying to, to compare their profiles to identify possible shared physical traits. Now, in order to determine who was a fit member of society and who was not, a whole series of measurements were developed to collect data on people's physical characteristics. Now, early modern, or I'm sorry, early Victorian notions of crime were shaped in large part by pseudosciences like phrenology. Uh, the way that phrenology worked, this was a very popular method of skull measurement. Again, we kind of have uh, charts on this. And a phrenologist, what they would do is they would make a map of the human head um, and then, you know, feel the bumps on a client and try to figure out uh, the patient's personality traits based on those bumps. So do you have one here? Do you have mark here? Are your acquisitiveness? Now, by the late 19th century, there was also the introduction of practices such as fingerprinting to, as a means of identifying individuals. But during the 1880s, um, Sir Francis Galton, who came up with, with fingerprinting, really used fingerprinting more for signs of heredity than identity. In fact, Galton also developed a system of classification to see if differences in IQ perceived attractiveness or criminal behavior could be associated with someone's racial or religious background. Now, alongside these ideas of hereditary traits of criminals, uh, when the Whitechapel murders or the crimes of Jack the Ripper occurred, there was also a new scientific discourse of criminology emerging, one that sought to demoralize crime. So perhaps criminals acted not out of moral depravity, but in response to environmental or heredity forces over which they have no control. Uh, criminal behavior, according to this school of thought, could be tied to social factors like poverty, alcoholism, abuse, or neglect. So what we see here is um, science starting to collide with ideas of social reform. Now, when the, uh, the, crime, the Whitechapel murders and the crimes of Jack the Ripper occurred, they were very widely reported in the press. Uh, in fact, not long after the second murder occurred, newspapers and their readers began to really shape uh, the Whitechapel murder reports. Readers began to send letters both to the police and to the press about the crimes. And for historians, these letters are extremely fascinating and also very, very insightful. In one sense, by, by sending these letters, uh, in one sense, by sending these letters, the public was kind of writing itself into the Ripper story. And since these letters tend to tell us more about the writers than the actual crimes, they provide us really valuable insight into the public's desires, the public's fantasies, and the public's fears surrounding these crimes. In another sense, because newspapers could determine which letters they wish to print or not print, the press was also able to shape public opinion. Uh, indeed, the press often used murder news uh, as an opportunity to warn readers against sin or to remind their readers of the wages of sin or improper behavior. Now, many, many of the, the letters, the Jack the Ripper letters that came in that were sent in and 
either published in newspapers or sent into um, the news agency and the police, suggested pretty conventional proposals, um, proposals to improve Whitechapel. So letters would suggest um, improved dwellings in Whitechapel. They suggested better lighting, improved paving, more religious intervention, more employment uh, for women especially. In other words, a lot of the letters that began to come in focused not on the murders, not on the murder, but on the, the lives of the victims themselves. Others did actually focus on the crimes and the killer and offered suggestions to help apprehend the killer. Um, they suggested things like smarter detectives. Uh, the, the police really came under fire during this, uh, this uh, case study. So they suggested things like smarter detectives, rubber sold boots for police constables so that they could kind of sneak up on perpetrators. Um, police constables dressed as women who might be able to lure in the killer. Bloodhounds, um, people called for more police patrols in Whitechapel and some even called for house to house searches. So we had those who are suggesting uh, efforts to improve the lives of the of of the impoverished, there were those who were suggesting ways to apprehend the killer, and then there were those who actually proposed sus suspects or even claimed themselves to be the killer. And it's, I want to look at some of those letters in a little bit more detail to start to think about what kinds of individuals emerged as potential suspects during the 1880s. This first letter, which I have up right now, is perhaps one of the most famous. Um, it's the Dear Boss letter. This letter was the first to have been claimed to be written by Jack the Ripper. Uh, it was sent to the Central News Agency on September 25th, 1888. Uh, it was addressed to Dear Boss and was written, as you can see, in red ink. The letter was immediately forward, forwarded to Scotland Yard. And then a few days later, a postcard actually arrived at the Central News Agency, which was smeared with blood, and it appeared to be the same handwriting as this first letter. And it also, this postcard referred to the double murder that had just occurred the night before. And so at the time, police thought these two items might actually be genuine. They published these uh, in posters, or on, copies of them on posters, that were sent to, to police stations, and the hope was to to raise public awareness about the danger posed by this killer. But the result was a flood of letters from other writers, all claiming to be Jack the Ripper themselves. I wanna look at this uh, letter in a little bit more detail. Here is a transcript. Uh, Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they have looked so clever and talked about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron, remember that leather apron? gave me real fits. I am down on whores and I shan't quit ripping them till I get up. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope, ha ha. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly wooden you. Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work and give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. And as you can see, it's signed, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Um, moving on to other examples. Uh, shortly after this, uh, this letter was sent in October of 1888, and again, looking at the transcript, uh, I'd like to, to point out that this time, it, this letter is also signed as Jack the Ripper, but is a little bit more specific. In this case, um, Jack the Ripper is being accused, uh, or a Poland Jew is being accused of being uh, Jack the Ripper. Another letter to look at, a third example, was published in the Evening News. Um, Sir, may I be allowed a small space in your esteemed journal to make a suggestion in reference to the Whitechapel murders? The fiend who has perpetrated these atrocities is supposed to be a man of the shabby genteel class who carries a shiny black bag, and many individuals of this description, therefore, are objects of suspicion. 
Rests have been made and several shabby folk, no doubt, are included in these arrests, yet to no effect. My theory is, sir, the murders may have been committed by a woman. And I think that the fact a woman has not been looked for supports my theory. If it is a woman, she is out, doubtless a maniac. The idea is not to be laughed at. A woman accustomed to midwifery, I think, is more capable and likely to inflict the dreadful mutilation which has attended these murders when thirsting for blood than a man of the shabby, genteel class who perhaps is even unmarried. So in this one, we actually have two theories pointed to. The shiny black bag likely refers to a doctor, and then certainly the, the letter writer's main uh, suspect is a woman. And this theory took on the name of uh, Jack the Ripper becomes Jill the Ripper. And then the fourth example I want to look at or point to is actually was published in New Zealand. So all the way on the other side of the world, this was published in the New Zealand Observer. Something had to be done and right here steps in the scientific humanitarian who determined to draw the attention of the world to the evil. This is exactly what CP seems to have done. The victims belonging to the class, which of all others suffers the most hideous and tragic fate in human lot. None of them found life worth living, all were drunken, vicious, miserable wretches, whom it was almost a charity to relieve of the penalty of existence. He took them to the very center of the plague spots to the existence of which he was desirous of turning the public attention. There he seems to have killed them with the mercifulest painlessness of science so that suffering was reduced to a minimum and death came as a welcome release to the insupportable miseries of existence. Then he seems to have waited to see if his action would have the desired effect. Finding his first essay unsuccessful in achieving his object, he repeated it and again repeated it. So in this case, Jack the Ripper is a scientific humanitarian. Now, as I said, many, many letters were sent in, many letters were published. I certainly have not read them all, nor do I have time to go through all of them today. But I do want to focus on the list of suspects that started to emerge as a result of these letters and newspaper reports. So based on the four that we just looked at, the suspects included a Jew, a woman, a doctor, and a scientific humanitarian. To this list with time, we can add a Russian Jew anarchist, a policeman, a local resident of Whitechapel, an erotic maniac of the upper classes, a religious fanatic, a gang of Englishmen, a Southern European, an Eastern European, a Malaysian, an American, an upper class gent, a butcher, and a shoemaker. A lot of suspects. But pause for a moment and look at that list and realize that there's not a single specific name on it. Instead, it's a very vague list. This was not always the case. Certainly, um, specific individuals were named, names were named. Um, in particular, Prince Albert Victor, better known as Prince Eddie, was accused. His tutor, James K. Stephen, was accused. The former prime minister, William Gladstone, was accused. The painter, Walter Sickert, was accused. Dr. Thomas Bernardo was accused. So as I said, names were named. But the lingering suspects, the ones that really captured the public's fancy, the ones that were paraded across the pages of the city's newspapers, tended not to be these specific individuals, but instead this kind of vague list based on stereotypes. And these stereotypes really reflect current social concerns. So let's go back to this vague list. Um, actually, let's go back to the more the, the four that we started with, the four identified in the letters that we looked at, and start to match these potential suspects with, as I said, uh, social concerns. Starting with that first one, not just a Jew, but a Polish Jew. According to uh, Judith Wachowitz, and this is a quote, an endemic form of anti-Semitism existed in the East End, in part an expression of traditional xenophobia, and in part a response to the unstable economy and shrinking material resources of the area. Whitechapel was experiencing a severe housing crisis due to the influx of Eastern European Jews and the conversion of housing stock into the warehouses and into warehouses and commercial properties, end quote. 
And in fact, even the term mother apron, which um, was mentioned in that first Dear Boss letter, referred to a Jewish slip maker by trade, one who uh, reportedly stalked women by night. And following the murders, especially following the double murder, further suspicion was cast on Jewish people living in the East End. There were examples of anti-Semitic slurs as well as anti-Semitic outbursts. Now this theory was discredited by police very quickly, but even still the impact of this theory remained and leather apron in particular became a very common term of abuse, abuse applied to Jews. To turn to that second suspect, a woman. Now many of these suggestions focused on prostitutes uh, who some considered to be so unsexed that they might be capable of such brutal murders, uh, murders which targeted female anatomy. Suspicion, however, was also extended um, beyond sex workers to also midwives and medical women uh, who represented the dangerous fact that medical knowledge had been placed within female reach. And even though sex workers, midwives, and medical women likely came from different social classes uh, and had different occupational knowledge, they also shared two common characteristics, which again represent fears of the time. First, they possessed dangerous sexual knowledge. Second, they asserted themselves into the public domain, considered the male domain. So in other words, the suspect of a woman of Jill the Ripper reflected fears of female sexuality, fears of female autonomy, fears of women in the public domain. That third suspect, the, the doctor, uh, this, this eerily evoked themes of medical violence against women that really pervaded fantasy equity literature, um, opening up the dissection, the mutilation of women. And it played on or, or really played out popular fears of surgeons, gynecologists, vaccinators, and more. Um, so think here of Robert Louis Stevenson or of other literature, fears of body snatching, um, fears of, of dig digging up corpses and selling parts or body parts to medical schools. So the doctor theory built on these negative associations surrounding the medical field at the close of the 19th century. And oddly enough, it was actually medical spokesmen um, who really kind of propagated this theory. Um, they noted that the, the, um, the wounds required such skill that the mutilation was likely um, inflicted by someone who had a knowledge of human anatomy. And this backfired, as I said, it was medical spokesmen who kind of put this theory out there, and then suddenly doctors and medical students found themselves cast as suspects. Some furthered this theory, saying it was not just a doctor, but it was a mad doctor, and in an effort to explain the motivation of the killer, some suggested that uh, he or she suffered from syphilitic madness and was sought seeking to, to avenge this um, on the practice of prostitution. Now, the fourth suspect is the scientific humanitarian. Uh, the scientific humanitarian, you may remember, killed not to raise attention to himself, but to raise attention uh, regarding the impoverished existence of those living in Whitechapel. Now, this idea was first propagated um, facetiously, I think, by the author George Bernard Shaw, and then it kind of took on a life of its own uh, in, in publications. And again, to, to quote a historian, Perry Curtis has noted, quote, these stories brought to the fore some of the most troubling social and moral issues of the day, notably poverty and prostitution, the threat of collective violence in the East End, xenophobia and anti-Semitism, the limits of journalistic decency, and of course, the ability of Scotland Yard to police the metropolis effectively, end quote. And in all of these uh, suggested suspects, I want to again draw your attention to, to the lack of detail, the lack of specific names. Because in many ways, I think this was intentional, or at least I think the lack of specificity speaks volumes. Because the problem here wasn't necessarily the individual. The problem people are arguing was prostitution, was poverty, was Whitechapel itself. So the entire social order of Whitechapel needed 
to be performed. And I think this idea is especially clear if we turn to this image right here. Um, this was published in Punch in September, on September 29th of 1888. And the image on the right there is the nemesis of neglect and then it was accompanied But to focus in on the image in particular, as you can see this, this individual kind of, um, I guess illustrates the lack of specificity in the list of suspects. So this, this person doesn't even really look human. Um, and looking, reading the caption below, the nemesis of neglect, there floats a phantom on the slum's foul air, shaping the eyes which have the gift of which have, sorry, which have the gift of seeing into the specter of that lowly fair, where face it, her vein is fleeing, red-handed, ruthless, furtive, and erect. Tis murderous crime, the nemesis of neglect. And indeed, if you look, as I said, the individual doesn't, almost doesn't even look human, but is kind of specter or phantom and written across his forehead is the word crime. So I think what we see happening here is Victorian London really wrestling with the question that sometimes arises in our own society. Is crime the problem or is crime a reflection? Now, many, not all, but many of the images that, that I've included uh, in this PowerPoint today actually come from the university archives, from school. And given that this is, this is part of a speaker series and the 50th anniversary of school, I want to close today by commenting on my use of this particular case study, Jack the Ripper, in the classroom. Now, I frequently take my classes uh, to the Hodges Reading Room to explore, a, to explore documents on, on a variety of subjects. Students have looked at World War I propaganda, they've looked at uh, the Irish famine, they've looked at documents from the Crimean War, the 1857 Indian Uprising, the Crystal Palace Exhibition, and of course, the crimes of Jack the Ripper. And over the years, um, Kathleen and Carolyn have really helped build, I think, a very helpful pop exhibit that allows students to locate Jack the Ripper, not just in the historical archives, but in late Victorian society more broadly. And for the students, I think this is tremendously helpful. Um, and for teaching, for pedagogical purposes, this is tremendously helpful in developing historical empathy and analytical and critical thinking skills. It provides students, I think, um, an opportunity to look at, even touch the tools and publications that were available to the late Victorian public as they struggled to understand and respond to the crimes of Jack the Ripper. It lets them look at, even touch, the tools and publications that are available to historians today as we continue to try to contextualize these crimes historically. And the documents that students look at include, um, certainly if I go back here for a second, for knowledge, if you look at that top upper photograph, you can see a student exploring um, both an image from phrenology and then also kind of a statue or sculpture of a head. Um, Students have also, as you can see in the other pictures, are looking at um, letters and then certain newspapers. In fact, this semester, uh, one of my students was particularly fascinated by this image, which, which we just talked about and which was on display in the reading room. And um, she was looking at it and reading it and she realized that she'd seen a reference to the nemesis of neglect, um, not just in this punch image, but also in another newspaper article published in the Times, which was a few documents over on the same table. And when she went to look at that, she saw that the Times article referenced yet another Victorian newspaper. And so this, in the course of one class meeting, this student was able to track this concept around the reading room from one Victorian publication to another, to another. And to me, these kinds of discoveries or experiences are crucial. They make history very real. They allow people to recognize and acknowledge and hear the discussions and debates of the past. They allow people, students, historians, to place themselves in the shoes of others, to exercise empathy, and to examine documents for insight 
into societies, both past and present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. That was really wonderful. And um, I think there are a few questions up. Are there any questions? I think Sean made a comment. Sean said, didn't one crime scene get cleaned because of its anti-Semitic message on the wall? Yes, Sean, that is true. Um, there were, it was following, I think it was following the double crimes, but I can't remember exactly which one. But yes, there were anti-Semitic slurs uh, painted and the, the police did take, erase those and then were cast under fire for having, um, you know, altered the crime scene, essentially. Carrie, did you have a, a question? I saw your hand up and then it went down. Carrie Bannon, okay. Um, I had a question. Were there other accounts of serial killers um, in Britain before Jack the Ripper or was this just the first time it was really sensationalized? That's a great question. Um, my understanding is that it's, it's really the first time that it was truly sensationalized. Uh, I don't know that there were necessarily other serial killers that were identified as such or kind of tracked through the press. And part of what we see happening in this particular case study is kind of the culmination of a number of different factors. Um, certainly things I talked about today is kind of interest in uh, social ills and reform initiatives and um, also science and industrialization. So uh, in immigration, but also um, there is kind of the rise of the press and sensationalist press and the penny press that's more affordable to many, many people and, you know, including images in the press, the London Illustrated News, um, all of that kind of makes almost a perfect storm for this just to be incredibly fascinating to the public, to the reading public. Thank you. Any other questions? I have one more, um, and it, this is to follow up on something Sean said as well. Were the police really that inept or was he just that elusive? <laughs> oh no, um, you know, the, the police, um, the Metropolitan Police I, I, was relatively new and it was a development of the 19th century. And so I think that probably the police were still gathering a number of, um, you know, different resources and, and, and possibilities themselves. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I hesitate to blame them. <laughs> so, but I also kind of hesitate to say that Jack the Ripper was that elusive. Um, I, again, I, I don't know. I don't know why he was never caught. I don't know who he was. <laughs> Have they ever counted kind of, or gotten a, an idea of how many copycats there were? Because I know that there were all kinds of letters being sent into the police. No, not that I'm aware of. Um, there were so many letters sent into the police. I mean, we're talking in the hundreds. And in fact, um, recently, within the last 15 years or so, Scotland Yard has actually uh, just released a whole nother kind of cache of letters, over 200, I think, um, that have been tied back to Jack the River. So that's also probably part of why he was never caught. Um, it's just because, I, I mean, maybe there weren't that many copycats um, but that's just such a flood of information. I don't know how any any institution or body could, could sift through it. Um, Suzanne is wondering, do you have one suspect that you think is the most probable? It's the inevitable question. <laughs> it is, it is the most inevitable question. The answer is no. And the answer is in part because um, I don't want this crime to ever be solved. Um, I think, the fact that it's not solved and the fact that there are so many sort of vague um, answers to it and it, it brings up so much about society more broadly, I don't want it to be solved because I, I want it to provide those insights into, um, into late Victorian society. So, so no, I'm sorry, I don't. And I, I have read, I read Patricia Cornwall's book that came out around 2000, looking at Walter, you know, blaming Walter Sicker specifically and I've read some of those things and I don't know if I'm not convinced or if I, as I said, I just don't want to be convinced. So Stacy was wondering, was there a difference between the ways different socioeconomic classes paid attention to the murders? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I will say that most of the research and the reading that I've done has focused on the middle class. So that is the, the easiest for me to speak to. Um, 
That isn't to say that the working classes, the lower classes or the upper classes, the aristocracy weren't interested. I think they were, especially, you know, uh, as I said, uh, one of the members of the royal family was actually accused. So I'm sure he was particularly interested in the crimes. Um, so I don't know that they necessarily reacted differently. Um, I will say that I think um, the middle classes and the upper middle classes reacted very strongly in trying to, as I said, kind of reform, socially reform the Whitechapel area. Um, this was a moment um, when there was kind of basically what was called slumming, where people would visit uh, the East End to observe, and there were settlement houses developed all across the East End to kind of try to provide education and bring education to people, um, religion to people. So it did really kind of feed into a very um, upper middle and upper class uh, social reform movement. Um, what I have not looked at in great detail is what is how the lower classes or the working classes responded. Just based, I would I would guess they were scared. Um, I, I would be if I lived there at that time. Um, but I don't know, you know, I don't know if they had any kind of specific. I can't remember if there were like specific movements or sort of riots that occurred there very well. Made. And kind of in that same vein, Shelby um, asked if there was any documentation of sex workers reactions to the murders at that time. Uh, again, I, that I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I would guess my gut tells me probably not, not or at least not any um, kind of organized response just in part because I, it, that was a very marginalized profession and so I don't know that people necessarily would have um, kind of joined together to make a statement. So they knew that they were being targeted but because of their poverty they still had to work so they were kind of in a, in a bind. Oh absolutely that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, Jill, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone in attendance today. Please um, be sure to join us next session um, of our speaker series, which will be rare book specialist, Carolyn Shangle speaking on signs of the past, campus ghosts at UNC Greensboro. And that will be on October 20th at noon. Thank, thank you, Jill. You. Thanks thank all. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>